Comfortably Zoned Radio Network proudly presents Weighted Donuts with co-hosts Wayne Unger and Craig Steer. Hello and welcome to Baseball with Craig and Wayne. Uh, tonight we have a special guest. Uh, we have the first designated hitter in Major League Baseball history, Ron Blomberg. Ron, welcome to the show. Well, it's great to be part of the show. It's great to be able to talk to people, and it's great to be able to talk to great baseball people. Thank you, Ron. Uh, uh, you know, Ron, let me, uh, I don't know, we're going to, I guess we, we, we have a lot of stuff we want to ask you both, Craig and I. So uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, you know, your name came up. Uh, well, we, 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 I had spoken to you a couple of months ago, and you couldn't make it. And then Ralph and I were having a discussion, and, uh, and I said, you know what? I said, I bet Ron might be a good person to ask about this. So I want to ask you uh, back, you know, you, you come from Atlanta. You grew up, I, I assume you grew up in Atlanta. I know you played high school ball there. Yep. Uh, Atlanta, you know, Atlanta... For me, I grew up in New York. Atlanta was still the South. It was still the 50s, the 60s. Uh, did you experience any anti-Semitism uh, in Atlanta? Well, you know, the funny part about it was, you know, of course I grew up in the days that uh, it was a very, very uh, touchy situation where uh, people didn't realize when I was growing up, uh, half my friends and half my teammates were in the KKK. And, you know, that was a big deal. You know, when you I, – I do a lot of stuff up in New York in the Northeast, and, and people would always ask me, did I, did I uh, see any problems? You know, I was very, very lucky, I guess, in my, uh, in my days that, I, you know, did I see any problems? I saw a lot of uh, 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 lynchings. I've seen a lot of uh, 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 cross burnings. I uh, saw a lot of marches with the John Birch Society and the KKKs. But uh, with me personally, uh, of course, being Jewish, you know, they don't like the Jews. They don't like minority groups. And, and so, you know, I was very, very lucky because, you know, being a, a pretty decent athlete, uh, you know, a, a lot of my teammates really did not know. See, Back in the days when the KKKs, I don't know if you ever seen the uh, the movie uh, uh, Mississippi uh, Birding, and uh, yes, that's how you know the South used to be. Uh, uh, very very uh, prejudiced, but you know I was very very lucky that you know I, I did not see it personally. Uh, I have seen it you know uh, uh, throughout you know. Uh, uh, living in Atlanta, and the big place that they had the cross burnings was a place called Stone Mountain. And Stone Mountain was a big uh, 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 rally place for the KKKs. And, uh, uh, of course, being Jewish, you know, I, I, you know, they never really bothered me because, you know, they always sort of, you know, looked up to me because they did you know, they, they put away being Jewish. They looked at me being an athlete. Because when I played ball, a lot of these uh, kids that grew up into the home of the KKKs were great athletes. And, you know, and, and, and they really uh, uh, coattailed it off my uh, professionalism where whenever I played uh, sports, they were always scouts. So when they're always scouts, they always just not scouted me. They were always scouted other people. So, you know, did I see it? Uh, I saw it, but I did not have any problems with it. I was very, very lucky. And what about African American athletes during that time? Did did they get a pass of of any kind, or, or were they or, or were they subject to the same strong? Oh, yeah, exactly the same thing. Uh, yeah. You know, when I, when I was growing up, and I don't know if you've been down south in the fifties or the sixties when no. uh, when I was. Uh, um, when I was growing up, Les, uh, uh, Lester Maddox was a governor, and uh, George Wallace, of course, was a governor of uh, Alabama. Alabama. And then you go to South Carolina, and as soon as you go over the border from Georgia to South Carolina, it says, Welcome to Plan Country. So, you know, it's, you know, you, you yeah, see Huey Long in Louisiana. 
Oh, absolutely. You know, and you know, and and people don't realize that you know it, it was it was a tough organization. You know, I mean, it was you know. So you know, uh, uh, I saw a lot of stuff, and you know, being uh, 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 being black down in uh, Atlanta at that particular time, and being Jewish like myself, you know, people don't realize that you would have to sit in the back of the bus. Uh, you would have your own water fountains. Uh, you know, whenever I used to go into a hotel, let's say, like in. Uh, Florida or Mississippi, whenever I was recruited and I had to go and stay in a hotel, uh, uh, you know, when they say Ron Bloomberg, you know, they would never say I was a Jew, but they would look at you like uh, a, 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 a jagged, you know, uh, I had horns. So, you know, you see that, you know, but I was very, very lucky throughout my life that my parents always told me that, uh, you know, I felt like I was a chosen person, and I was very, very lucky. I was blessed with a lot of athletic ability. Uh, I had a lot of uh, uh, friends. Uh, like I said before, I grew up with the KKKs, but they never bothered me. Uh, they took me into their house. Uh, they never asked me about uh, Rosh Hashanah, of course, Young Kipper, or Passover, anything like that. And, you know, so, hey, Ron, you know, nothing was ever brought up. So, Ron, right. this is, yeah. Ron, this is Craig Steer, a big yes, fan. Craig. It's great having you on. I, Thanks, a Craig. quick question, though. I mean, do you, do you, did you, in retrospect, do you feel like you got a pretty much a, a free pass because you were such a great athlete? I think so. Other Jew, did you see other Jewish kids, uh, you know, being picked on and whatnot? And, and how large a Jewish community did you grow up in? Were there many Jewish kids down there? Did your family belong to a synagogue? Oh, yeah. It was a synagogue. It was uh, the largest in Atlanta. It was called the AA. And we probably had maybe maybe 150 families. Uh, Atlanta at that particular time was not a lot of Jews down here. Uh, did I see other Jews get picked on? Uh, well, not really. Uh, but you always would hear if I would, you know, you, you, you know, back then you would always hear that, you know, Jews had horns, right. uh, the KKKs. Uh, 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 my father had a jewelry store on uh, uh, down in Atlanta on Peachtree Street. Now every uh, every uh, street in Atlanta is being Peachtree Street. Okay, <laughs> so my father uh, was right in the middle of downtown and. Uh, uh, the KKKs always had their march, and they always would have two, three hundred people, and they would pass out their brochures about the KKKs and John Birch Society, and they you, you would see, uh, uh, you know, in the pamphlets, you would see uh, uh, a, a black being lynched or a Jew uh, being stabbed or you know knived or whatever. You would see this, and. Uh, but my parents, I was very, very lucky. My parents always told me, always look uh, uh, straight ahead and uh, don't worry about it because you are a chosen person. And I feel like I was a chosen person because I was blessed just not being a, a good athlete, but a person that really did not let that bother me. And I think that meant a lot going up to New York and having a lot of pressure being a Jewish athlete that nothing really bothered me. So, you know, mm -hmm. so uh, you see it now. People don't realize that the KKK is still out there. And, you know, and people don't realize that there's a lot of places up in upstate New York and Pennsylvania where there are the KKKs up there. So, you know, I mean. California, every place. There are, every place. There, it's, you know, yeah. you know and uh, uh, so, you know, hey. You know, what you got to do is, you know, you got to look uh, uh, past that. And, you know, and, and you know, and, and I was very, very lucky I did. And I had a lot of bl great black friends down in Atlanta, uh, uh, like I said before. You know, and now let me tell you another quick story that, you know, whenever we played a, a baseball game or a basketball game on a Friday night, you know, uh, my teammates would uh, drive their car to the uh, to the games, and they would park, of course, and they would have their robes and their hoods inside their cars. So right after 
uh, after the game is on Friday, they would go to the uh, cross burnings up in Snow Mountain. So, you know, I, I've seen all that. You know, I mean, I was, I was born with this. And uh, uh, so I'm very, very lucky to be able to talk to people, you know, and to uh, and I'm, thank God that, you know, 98% of the mess is not there anymore, and hopefully we're going to be uh, reunited into one big group. Yeah, that'd be nice. That'd be nice. Did you have any problems with the Yankees in the Yankee management in any way coming up? Was there anything about your Judaism that, um, that got in the way on any level? You know, the funny part about it is when I first signed when I was 17 years old in 67, and uh, a lot of people, they knew that the Yankees were going to draft me number one in the country in 67. And a lot of my uh, – uh, I did not have many relatives, but my family knew some people that were up in New York, and the first thing that they would say is, you know, you, you know that the Yankees are very anti-Semitic. You know, that was the first thing. You know, they, you know, they, they never had a, a, a really a, 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 a Jewish Yankee. They really never had a Jewish Yankee would say, I am a Jew. You know, so, uh, um, right. so, uh, when I got Let alone there, a black until 1956. With Elson Howard, right? Of, yes. With Ellie. Absolutely. And, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, Ellie and I were very, very extremely close, and uh, uh, we always would speak that uh, uh, me being a Jew, and he, he was being the first, uh, I think, Afri uh, African American American to uh, play for the Yankees and to to be really that good. Uh, he really never, the Yankees really never bothered him, uh, because let me tell you something: when I signed with the Yankees. Uh, CBS owned the Yankees in 67, and right. it was basically just a, uh, uh, a business deal from CBS. But the funny part about it, the, uh, the president of CBS, uh, uh, for guy, Bill Paling, Bill Palick, uh, was a Jew who owned CBS, who was but the he president died of CBS. very shortly after the deal was made, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Yeah. And, 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 and when I was up there, when I got up there, it was Michael Burke, who, of course, was not right. Bush. It was Lee McPhail. It was Johnny Johnson. Uh, it was a guy named George Fister. But the, the funny part about it, once you got inside the, the, uh, 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 the business end of the Yankees, there was a guy named Howard Burke. Uh, was there was Pell. Uh, uh, yeah. There was Bob, uh, Bob Fischel. Remember Bob Fischel? Mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, of course, Marty Appel was there. So there was a lot of there was a lot of Jews inside the Yankee organization, and uh, I did not have a problem at all. They, hey, you know, I mean, I'm coming up, you know, and, and you know, we're in the Bronx, and X amount, well, let's say 60 percent of the people when I was there were Jews, and they all lived on the Grand Concourse, and you know. Right. And can't, could you picture them treating me bad? And I'm saying something to the Daily News and the New York Post, and I'll be like uh, uh, A-Rod now. I, I'll be like the Pazzarazzi's. Uh, I'll be in the uh, paper and the, uh, uh, the, you know, I mean, I'll be spotlighted throughout. But I have never had any problems whatsoever. They have been unbelievable to me. Uh, the uh, uh, when uh, George uh, uh, Steinbrenner took over the team, it was unbelievable. You know, let me tell you something. I was very lucky, and that was one of the reasons why I signed with the Yankees, because, you know, not just, you know, the Yankees were all my, always my favorite team. You know, when you, be, when you could put that Yankee pinstripe on and to go out to Yankee Stadium where, you know, everybody talk, down south, football was the main sport down south. Everything was football. To the Atlanta Crackers, the Atlanta Crackers was a minor league team, and then the Atlanta Braves came in because they left Boston, came to Atlanta, and, uh, you know, but baseball was not as large as football. So now all of a sudden, you know, I get, dra you know, I get drafted by the Yankees, 
And that was a no-brainer. And people don't realize in 67, I signed a basketball scholarship to go to UCLA with John Wooten. I signed a, yeah, uh, really? a basketball I scholarship. Ask, I want yeah, to ask I signed a basketball that. scholarship with uh, 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 John and uh, I signed a letter of his intent. But the only way for me to get out of signing with John was to sign professionally. And when you sign that letter of intent, you cannot go like you do now. You know, if you're a recruit, you know, you go to, you, you, you know, you tell these uh, colleges you're going to play for them, and you jump to different, you know, jump, jump to different colleges. But yeah, you're losing myself, here. Yeah, you know, and, and myself, when I got drafted by the Yankees, I mean, that was a no-brainer to me. Being, you know, 17 years old, being a Jew, moving up to New York, being, being in the largest Jewish community, uh, the first Jewish Yankee, you know, it was a big deal. It was wonderful. It, even to this yeah, day, that's cool. that I've been out of the game for X amount of years, you know, they treat me like it, it's, it's, I feel like a, like a Donald Trump who was there, you know, or whoever, you know, or Rudy Giuliani or whatever. Whenever I go into a hotel, they treat me so well, you know, uh, most of the guys would, you know, say, are you Ron Bloomberg? Uh, the first DH, New York Yankees, <laughs> or they would ask me, they would ask me, am I related to Mayor Bloomberg? So it's a no-brainer. I always would say, yeah, I'm, uh, he's my uncle. So I get the uh, – so it, 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 it's been fun for me. You know, it, it's great. And, you know, the people up in New York have been unbelievable. They're the best fans in the world. Uh, just like hey, Wayne said. wants you to elaborate on your relationship with Ellie because when Wayne was a kid – Ellie was his favorite ball player. Oh, Ellie was great. I mean, he was the best of the best. I mean, we used to, uh, during the off season, people don't realize we did not make any money. So we had, I had my own basketball team at that particular time. And so Ellie was on the team, and everybody, we used to go to high schools to play the uh, uh, high school coaches. And that was a big deal that, that we would we would have. It was myself, Chris. It was Emlis, It was Ellie. Uh, it was Phil Rizzuto. Phil didn't play, but Phil would always come to the games. It was Thurman Munson. It was Walt, uh, Walt Williams. Was Williams. It was Ron Sraboda. It was Ron Sraboda. It was Ed Cranepool. We had these guys. And the funny part about it, we made no money. But, you know, when we played, they paid us $25 a piece. So, but it was fun. But it, it was great. And Ellie was such a great – number one, Ellie was a great coach, but he was my mentor. He was – we were so close to – you know, even to this day, his wife, Arlene, and we're very, very extremely close. And uh, Cheryl and Al Downing. Oh, Al Downing. You couldn't find nicer people. You're talking about Minches. You're talking about, you know, Al and I, we play on the fantasy camp every single year. Al still lives in California. He's, he's, Al's he's been a guest on our show. And, um, he's a gentleman, a gentleman. You know, and, yes, he you is. know number one, and, he's a great speaker. He's a wonderful human being, and he's great for the game of baseball. This is what he said yeah. about Ellie. He said, Ellie is the greatest guy I ever met. Oh, he Not was. just in baseball. But in life, that's he what down said about he was, he, he was he was a gentle giant. That Ellie was number one. He right. was a great ball player. He was a little bit before my time, but I saw him uh, uh, his last few years with the Yankees, and also uh, I think his last year with the Red Sox. I believe. Am I right? Been '67 yeah. when when yeah, uh, and you know, and I, I, I saw him, and then he became my coach. And he was such a great guy. We used to do everything together, you know. And and Ellie was such a, a number one. He was number. He was such a nice human being. And you know, he was, you know, he was a great guy to talk to. Uh, he was just a. He he was a mensch, just like Al said. You know, I mean, uh, he, he he would do anything for you. Uh, we used to go out together all the time. He lived in uh, 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 Teaneck. Uh, that's where uh, uh, Ellie was from, and he still, uh, Arlene still has his house in uh, uh, T-Deck. And uh, so, you know, it's, and I lived in Riverdale, and Riverdale was just right across the bridge. So, you know, I mean, uh, we used to get together all the time. Families used to get together all the time. 
Craig, do you have some I, questions? Yeah, I want Craig, to ask go ahead. I, I, want, I, want, I want to go back to uh, your senior year in high school. Yes. And I want, to, I want to get a feel for what it was like playing all the sports you played. But, in, you know, at some point, um, the word got out that you were going to most likely be the number one selection in, in, the, in the draft. Yeah. And I was just wondering, I mean, you were the Bryce Harper. I mean, just nowadays the draft is – I know, you know, back then it, it wasn't the extravaganza that it is today. But yes. still you knew that the Yankees had the number one pick, and you knew that there was a very good chance that they were going – like, did they reach out to you? Did other teams – uh, I mean, how did it work back then? Did you did you have workouts for the for? Oh team? no, no, not at they all. Just... They they scouted you just like uh, anybody else. It's uh, uh, it was a scouting service. Uh, they used to come out to watch your ball games. If it's uh, 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 high school games, if it was American Legion, if it was uh, uh, you know uh, any any type of league. I, I started getting scouted when I was in the ninth grade. Uh, uh-huh. And um, but I started getting uh, college scholar well not scholars scholarships but always looked at when I was in the tenth grade uh, mm-hmm. from base, basketball football and and baseball uh, back then when we were in high school we just played like ten or twelve games it was not big it was not mm-hmm. big at all and right. most of the baseball games that you played was American Legion in American Legion you might play. 25 games. Nowadays in high school, these guys are playing 30, 40 games, and they play travel ball for another 70, 80 games. So we did not have that luxury. Uh, Whenever we played baseball, we would jump from baseball over to football, football over to basketball. It was never a specialty sport where one person played one sport. Everybody played all sports. So I was very, very blessed that, you know, I was good in basketball, I was good in football, I was good in baseball. Uh, people always ask me, you know, I mean, it, it came natural to me. You know, so right. being a Bryce Harper, okay, here's a guy that uh, Bryce, when I played baseball, baseball was a lot different than what it is now because we did not play it, we did not have the, uh, I would say, these professional trainers to train you for that one sport, you know, if you're, you know, if you can hit, you can hit. You know, how did how did I hit a baseball? I saw the ball, that's one got hit it. Nowadays, you got computers telling you how you hit a baseball. Exactly. Uh, right. Being a pitcher, they tell you how to hold a, 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 a baseball. They tell you how to, sl- you know, I mean, everything came natural. You know, we didn't have the, uh, uh, you know, these professional. Uh, 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 instructors to uh, where the parents will give you where the parents give instructors X amount of dollars to train you 80, 90% of your time number one, right. my parents had no money and we could not have done that uh, I did not hang around with the people that have a lot of money uh, we just played sports just probably like yourself where you know you come home you play you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, you play handball, you, you play stickball, you know, you play right. baseball all the time. We're the same way. Were, were you the best of the best in your neighborhood in school? Were you the best guy? Yeah, no, you had. No, I mean, you I had started shoulders dunking about the basketball when I was in the ninth grade, and I was like five nine. And you well, know, was there anybody else that was a really great no. athlete? Uh, yeah, it was yeah, just as good yeah. as you and didn't make it for one reason or another? No, you know, back when I started, we had Walt Frazier. Uh, Walt, oh. of course, uh, uh, nice. was a great basketball player, of course. Uh, we had, you know, Fran Tarkenton uh, coming from Athens, Georgia, was just, you know, 60 miles away from Atlanta. But he was before me. But did we have a lot of – we had a lot of great athletes, and we had a lot of great athletes – that did not, you know, we had a lot of great athletes that get signed, but for one other reason, they did not make it for whatever reason. Uh, we and had it really you know, surprised you that you thought, wow, this guy more. didn't make it? He was so Oh, absolutely. Great. You know, you grew up with guys. When I got drafted number one by the Yankees, we had four number one draft picks uh, from Atlanta that year. 
and uh, oh, wow. and you know I was the only one that actually made uh, 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 you know the big well not I wasn't the only one that made the big leagues but I was the only one that actually stayed up there. There was a couple of guys that had you know a couple of guys had shoulder problems. Uh, a couple of guys, uh, you know, uh, for whatever reason, they did not make it. Uh, I think uh, in, in the year that I played, John Milner was uh, – uh, remember John Milner, who was with the Mets, who uh, came up, who had a pretty decent year, you know, a couple of seasons with the Mets. Right. And yeah, he was a great happened. athlete. He was a great athlete. But, uh, yeah. uh, but back then, it's a lot different. People don't realize that the, nowadays – it's a specialty type of uh, sport. You look at Bryce Harper, of course, Bryce Harper is blessed with, you know, great athletic ability. But, you know, he was trained, and he was like, uh, 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 he went to one school to another school to get the professional coach, coaching where we did not have. Uh, he had professional trainers. Uh, we did not have that. So, you know, it's, it's a lot different. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say, you know, to me, the best ball player that I have seen now is Mike Trout. See, Mike really? Trout, I love to watch Mike Trout play. You know, yeah, he's, he's just got five simple. tools. Oh, but he's just not a, a great baseball player, but he, he's, he's a good ambassador for the game of baseball. And, of course, being from New Jersey or whatever, but, you know, he, you know, I mean, but he's fun to watch. Bryce Harper, you look at him, and, you know, I, I never met him before. You know, I knew Stan Caston, who Stan, of course, uh, uh, worked for uh, 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 the Nationals, and he was uh, uh, president for the Nationals for a few years, and then they drafted him, and, you know, Bryce Harper was molded into a great baseball player, and, but, but he was blessed with all the talent, and he's been very, very lucky that, you know, he's had no injuries. So, you know, so, you know he, he's, he's a great baseball player, great to watch, but to me, Mike Trout is one step higher than he is because Mike Trout is not just a great baseball player, but he's a great ambassador for the game of baseball, and he's good to the fans, and he good and he's good for the people outside of the game. That's a nice sentiment. I'm going to ask you one more question, and I'm going to let these guys take over, and I'm going to shut the heck up. What was your first old timers game like when you were a rookie, or maybe your second? What old? What really impressed you about old timers games? Give me some interactions you had with guys, maybe at DiMaggio or whatever. Oh, um, this is when I wasn't playing. This was when I was actually no, playing. No, when you when you were still. Oh, when, when I came up, well, let me tell you. When I came up in nineteen, uh, well, I signed in sixty seven. I came up a little uh, in nineteen sixty nine and came up all together in seventy. And and when I was uh, in an old Thomas game in nineteen seventy, and you know, and uh, these guys. At that particular time, the Yankees would always play the all-stars of these other teams. And it's not like now where you get a group of uh, 40, 50 Yankees and you play against one another. But when I, right. when I was there, oh, let me tell you something. My, actually, my first, uh, uh, when I was, uh, my, I was right in the corner uh, and I took Mickey Mantle's uh, uh, locker. They gave me Mickey's locker. Okay. Uh, now, when I got there, when I was 19 years old, when in uh, 69 or 70, I forgot what it was. I remember my first guy that was in my locker, that Pete Sheehy, and Pete Sheehy was a clubhouse uh, guy for the Yankees for 100 years, and that's who they named the clubhouse uh, after was Pete Sheehy uh, uh, Clubhouse. And right. he put Joe DiMaggio into my locker, and you know, I'm wow. sitting there, and I'm 19 <laughs> years old. Now, do I know Joe DiMaggio well? No. I remember that he was married to uh, Marilyn Monroe. That was a big thing. And I remember Mr. Coffee, and that was okay. the time he did Mr. Coffee, and I looked at him, and, and um, you know, and he was so nice to me. 
He was such a gentleman to me. And he looked at me, and he knew me. And I had no idea how he knew me because, you know, I mean, I'm wide-eyed. You know, because my favorite player was Mickey Mantle. And when I went into the clubhouse with Mickey Mantle, that was my idol to be idol. And with Joe DiMaggio there was uh, – he felt like a grandfather to me. Does that make sense to you? He felt like a grandfather to me. He was like uh, uh, – he was, he was not my idol – but I knew he was one of the greatest of all greats. So he asked right. me, and he asked me, and he sat down, and he said, Ron, and he said, can I borrow a pair of your shoes? And I said, oh, a sh-. you know, back then, we didn't have a 100 pairs of shoes. Back then, we probably had two or three pairs of shoes, and that's all we had. That's all we had. So I said, absolutely. So I gave him my shoes. Uh, I remember the people were coming into the Yankee clubhouse at that particular time. It was uh, Sandy Koufax. It was Hank Greenberg. Uh, it was Joe Black. It was uh, 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 Casey Stingle. Uh, it was uh, uh, all these guys. It was like uh, um, uh, uh, did you French get to Frisetti. talk to Joe? Gre- did you get to talk to Hank Greenberg? I did. I did. Uh, Hank. Uh, 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 you know, I mean, he was he was a big guy. I mean, he was huge. Yeah. I mean, he was like to me, he looked like a Frank Howard to me. He was he was a big man. He was a real big man. But I I sat down with him, and he knew I was Jewish, and uh, so I really didn't know too much about him because the big Jewish ball player back home was Sandy Koufax, of course, and everybody would talk about Hank Greenberg too, but. In the first voice, they would talk about Sandy Koufax, okay? Of course. And, uh, but Hank sat down with me. No, uh, 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 Greenberg sat down with me and said, Ron, you know, how do you love New, how do you like New York? I said, it's incredible. He said, let me tell you something. He said, when I came up and I was in Detroit, he said, there was so much, uh, 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 uh anti Semitic uh, feelings towards me. And, you know, and whatever I do, they always look at me like I had horns, and they said, this is Jew boy. And and uh, and I said, no, I've never had any of that problems like that. And he said, you're very, very lucky. And he said to me, he said, whatever you do, don't ever uh, 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 change your religion or be uh, – uh, never say that your <coughs> last name was uh, uh, Ron – Seth always would say, you know, tell your name. Be always proud. I said, I am proud. Like that, he said, that's all you need to do. You're like that. And that was the last time I spoke to him. And then I became friends with his son, who uh, uh, became an agent, and then he said, I haven't seen him. Yeah, and then I haven't seen him in so many years. And then he started working for the baseball. uh, uh, MLB, right? Yeah, MLB. And... uh, but I remember talking to Hank. I remember, you know, even to this day, I probably talk to Sandy Koufax maybe once every year or two. And Sandy, I don't know if you ever spoken to him before, but Sandy was a very uh, introverted type of human being. But he was such a genuine person. And he's a type of guy that will, you know, you could see that's coming. Uh, he looks like a guy that uh, um, uh, he would be in like uh, – uh, he looked like a Frankie Valley, a tall Frankie Valley with the nice hair, and he looked like he right. would be singing. He looked like he'd be singing because he was all spoofed up, and he looked so good, and he came in so polished, and he came in so, you know, it was it, it was incredible. I mean, when I was there, when I was sitting there, and stupid me, I was never smart enough to get autographs, but I was in awe, but I was the first guy that whenever they took batting practice, you wouldn't believe me running out there watching these guys. And, you know, watching a Mickey Battle, a Joe DiMaggio, uh, Elston Howard was playing, uh, 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 all these guys, all these big guys, Gil, Gil Hodgers, you know, I mean, all these guys. And Casey Stinkle was a manager in the on the other part I forgot who was the manager, maybe Frankie Crosetti or, you know, whoever, whoever was over there. But I'm looking over there, and I'm saying to myself, 
two things. How great this is, how one day am I going to do this? Mm-hmm. And I did it 40 years later. You know? So, uh, yeah. so, you know, it's uh, – uh, so it's uh, – they passed the torch down, and the Yankees to this day are the only uh, team that has a uh, uh, Thomas Day, and it's great. It's great yeah. to be a Yankee. Wow. It's great to be able to wear that pinstripe. Wow. Craig, go ahead. you got some more questions. I just a couple little tidbits. And you should know also – um, your place in Yankee history is, is, is well set. And, you know, tons of kids grew up idolizing Mickey Mantle and, and, and Joe DiMaggio, but you need to know that you were idolized also. You know, I, know. I, I was very, very lucky because whenever I speak to Jewish organizations like I do many, many times, and, and I've been very, very blessed, and uh, I've had fathers come up to me and, and say that, you know, uh, I wasn't good in baseball, but always would have my baseball bat and always would swing like you and always knew that you would not play on Russia Shun and Young Kipper. And I knew that you were good for the Jewish organizations. And whenever, yeah, no, I've, I've, whenever there was a, 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 a place I would go, I would go to uh, services in New York. I would go to services in, uh, uh, in the city and also I would go to services in, uh, uh, Riverdale, and I was always a proud Jew, and I was always very, very lucky to know that you know this is where I am. I was, I was very lucky to be able to be blessed to be a chosen person, and even to this day, you know, and and to be able to be part of that, and that's why I uh, uh, I uh, wrote a book, you know, designated Hebrew, because mm-hmm. w- when something happens to me and they uh, uh, put me down under and I'm going to put the DH, it's, and I'm going right underneath it, the designated Hebrew. So, so nice. it's it's been fun. So it's it's you know when you, when you're up in New York and you, you you come in the city after, you know you, you play there for so many years and you know and and after so many years you're out of baseball. Ninety five percent of baseball players are forgotten. They're forgotten, to be honest with right. you. But that other five percent. Uh, and I always tell people, people will remember one thing about you. Uh, they remember if you're a good person, good to the people, and also they remember one thing that you did in the game of baseball. And I was very lucky to get into the Hall of Fame, the back door rather than the front door, and to have that uh, DH where I never thought it's going to be in existence 43 years and it's still there, and it's 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 been fun. I've had such a great run out of it. Uh, you know, I mean, to this day, you know, I, I get so many calls, and I, I speak at so many Jewish organizations throughout the country, and and to be able to uh, 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 be a role model, and, and these kids, you know, they have never seen you play baseball before. But they always would remember. They always will uh, get a a book. Uh, the uh, I would say uh, it, uh, the Jews in baseball, and uh, they would always uh, see the write ups about me and this and whatever. And it's really really fun. And and, and Art Shamsky and myself had an opportunity to go over to manage in uh, Israel in 2007. It was myself, uh, Art Shamsky, and Kenny Holzman. And that was a wonderful. It had to be very cool. <laughs> oh, you know, it's not the baseball part of it, but to be able to yeah. do something that you loved your whole life, and to be able to go over to Israel and to where the place where Adam and Eve started, and to look at all the uh, uh, relics and all the hills and and all the uh, uh, sunflowers and you know it, it, it. You know, hey, I've been very blessed. I've been very Anyone, lucky. I got a great and, family. Both of my kids are doctors and got a wonderful wife and you know, what more can you know, hey, God's been great to me and you know, and but I always try to give back to him to 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 do things that I enjoy doing and you know and and you know, I was very blessed to do something. But to be able to 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 be with kids and I don't know if you knew that 
you know, I, I run a camp up in uh, uh, Pennsylvania. It's called the New Jersey Y Camp. It's the largest uh, Jewish sleepaway camp in the country. It's We have 4,000 kids up there in the Poconos. It's a sleepaway camp. It's the largest. It's really? a hundred-year-old camp. It's a hundred. You know where Milford, Pennsylvania is? Mm-hmm. I do really well. It's near Dingman's Ferry, as a matter of Correct, fact. Correct, right you know. there. It's right next to uh, uh, Port, uh, Port Jarvis. And Port Jarvis, right. There. right. And I yeah. went to Kittatinny Camp for many years in the 50s, and um, it was right, ne- right near. A beautiful oh, there's country. tons of camps. There's tons of camps. So uh, it's the largest Jewish sleepaway camp in the country. It's uh, close to 4,000 kids in the summertime. It's myself there. It's Herb Brown. Uh, it's uh, Shlomo Glitzstein. Have you heard of him, the tennis player? Absolutely, Shlomo, yeah. yes. Shlomo is there. Uh, we have the number one uh, lacrosse player who is, uh, well, I mean, he's professional. He's, he plays for the New Jersey Lizard, uh, Max Seabolt. Uh, we have uh, 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 Liddy Kraselberg, who won six gold medals oh, in the uh, 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 Olympics. You probably heard of him. And uh, so it's, this is my uh, 11th year. I love doing it. It's it's wonderful, and I go up there in July and August, and we have kids up there, and you know the kids, uh, you know they they know you, and then I take them to Yankee Stadium, and when I take them to Yankee Stadium, they have the Ron Bloomberg T-shirts, and all the people come up to them and talk to them, and and I'm there with them and stuff like that. So you know it's it's you know what? Let me tell you something. When you could get out of baseball, and you know. And and to be able to enjoy your life after the game of baseball and to be able to give back to whatever, to kids, and and to be uh, still popular in New York and to be still uh, 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 respected in New York, it, what, how, how can you, you know, I mean, hey. Well, you got nachos. That's what yeah, you got. Yeah, you know, let me tell you, I'll tell you a real, real funny story. You know, I don't, you know, you're probably bored listening to me. But my son no. just went up to, uh, my son is an anesthesiologist down in Miami at Memorial. He's a chief anesthesiologist. He's a, I'm proud of him. He's the youngest uh, chief anesthesiologist in the country. Okay. So really? he got promoted last year. Okay. So he's up in New York. He's, uh, he took his uh, mother-in-law and the father-in-law went up there, and they had uh, surgery up there. And uh, he was at Lenox Hill, I believe he was at Lenox Hill. I, I don't know. Yeah, I think so. And uh, he could not go in the operating room, but, you know, the uh, anesthesiologist came out to tell the family what he, they going to do and stuff like that. And, and my, uh, he said, uh, introduced himself, and my son said, Adam Bloomberg, like that. Bloomberg. Bloomberg. Now, are you related to the baseball player, Ron Bloomberg? He said, that's my father, like that. So, you know, they had a nice relationship and stuff like that. So it's very, very nice to be able to, to uh, uh, you know, I mean, let me tell you something. It's, you know, I feel sorry, and, I, you know, I feel sorry like A-Rod. And I tell A-Rod whenever I go into uh, Old Timer's Day, I said, how you doing? And like this, he said, a couple of years ago he was having a tough time with the people and this and whatever like that. I said, the people are the greatest in the whole world. I said, but you got to be good to them. you got to talk to them. you got to relate to them. These are baseball fans. They're not stupid. They're going to, you know, they, they know, you know, they, they sitting up in the uh, stands. Uh, they got the uh, uh, the baseball sheets. They're the only uh, – uh, uh, they're the only team in the game of baseball actually keeping score of you like that. And they know everything what you do. They know, you know, you're sitting down and watching whoever. and They know everything. So what you got to do is be part of them. And if you're part of them, they'll love you. And, you know, and I told him, I, know, I don't know if he's done anything for him. So, you know, I mean, uh, hey. But, uh, um but it's it's been fun. Life is life is fun. You know that's what I, I I'm very very lucky in my life to be able to be do people like yourself. And you know we're lucky to, we're lucky to have you on. You're terrific. Well, I really appreciate that. You know, and and you know, and I I try to you know talk to people. You know, when I go into the stadium, I'm talking to people. People come up to you, and they're talking to you. And that's what's so bad about the game of baseball now. It's 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 became a business rather than a game, and you know 
people don't realize, and I always tell the people when I'm speaking at organizations, and I always tell the people, I said, let me tell you something. The, the, the fans are the ones that are the heroes of this game. We're the guys that we played a game, and most of us are living a, a, a fairy tale. And we, we, we could put on the Yankee pinstripes on. We could put on whoever uniform on to go out and play. And, you know, they're going to cheer you. They're going to boo you. But that's part of the game. But, you know, but, you know these are the guys that want your autographs. These are the kids that are looking up to people. But unfortunately now, the kids don't even know batting averages now. They just know how many millions of dollars these guys are making. <laughs> so, you know, they don't know if you're hitting 312 and, that, you know, you're hitting 295 with a guy on third base and how many, how many times you moved over from a guy from first over to third and how many times you had to sacrifice fly. They don't look at that anymore. They just look right. at you get a base hit and that base hit costs – Two hundred thousand dollars, you know, like, and this is that just that just irritates. It's sad, really. Is it's real fans. Yeah, yeah. it's real fans because the, you know you go down to fantasy camp. I don't know if any of y'all have been to Yankee fantasy camp or no, Mets fantasy camp or whoever fantasy camp. It's it's a wonderful feeling because these are guys that are really the fans. These are guys of forty up to eighty, eighty five years old. These are guys who know everything about you. These are the guys that have taken pictures of you. I, I I hate to tell you how many times I have uh, signed autographs of pictures that I signed when I was when I was uh, playing when I was eighteen years old, and this kid was like uh, uh, seven to eight years old, and he came down to get my autograph. And he got a baseball with my signature on it, and the baseball looked like it was uh, uh, 60 years old. So, you know, I mean, these are the fans. He kept it. Oh, he kept it. Yeah. You know, these, right. but th- those are the true fans of the game of baseball. Okay. Hey, Ron, I want to ask you Ron? a question. I, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question. Um, I remember being a kid. And uh, I got Sports Illustrated on a weekly basis and yeah. Sporting News on a weekly basis. And I went back and looked. I remembered you were on the cover of yes. Sports Illustrated the summer of 73 with Bobby Mercer. Yes. And that same week you were on the cover of the Sporting Sports News. Sports Illustrated. No, Sporting News. Yeah. And I was just wondering, do you remember anything about the photo shoot? Do you remember? Oh, what, absolutely. Uh, it was at Old Yankee Stadium. No, not uh, Tony. It was, yeah, it was, uh, we went over to, when did we go to Shea? 75, 75 I think. I think. 75, yeah. yeah. It was at the old Yankee Stadium. I was hitting, at that time, I was hitting 406. And I remember that uh, uh, Marty Appel and Bob Fischel came down to tell me that uh, Sports Illustrated was here. And they wanted to do a shoot with, uh, at that time, the Yankees were just coming back. They were doing pretty good. And I remember that uh, I sat in there with uh, Bobby and we did the shot. We, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, it, I mean, it was great. I mean, it was, you know, I mean, and then the next month, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're walking down the street in Riverdale or you're walking wherever and people grabbing you and you go on the cover of Sports Illustrated and, you know, you're in, Every, you know, this and, you know, at that time, Sporting News was a big uh, uh, mag, uh, big paper, and oh, yeah. that was a big deal. And, you know, so it was really fun. I mean, it was remember hey, It was fun. It was it was, it was great. And this, even uh, to the day when Bobby passed away, we used to talk about it all the time. And, and Kay Mercer, of course, his wife, and I see her, her at Old Timers Day, and she talks about it all the time. Uh, you know, the funny part about it, uh, she gets those, uh, 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 Sports Illustrated in the, uh, uh, in the mail all the time, and they want her to sign over Bobby's picture. And, uh, uh-huh. so, you know, so that's nice. And I see Diane Munson, and people don't realize that I've roomed with Thurman for four years, and, you know, we became extremely close, and he came up a year before me, and, and, you know, our families became extremely close, and we lived in Paramus, New Jersey together, and we lived on road trips together, and, you know, oh, wow. we ate at different, we were at the same houses, and when I had Passover, he would come over to our house, and, you know, so, I mean, it was, 
we had a, we had a wonderful uh, relationship. Thurman Munson on Pesach. That's something to think about. Yeah. yeah let me tell you something. He was a wonderful human being. He, he was. He was. He was. He was. He was not just only a great uh, ball player. He was a leader of our team. And I always tell people nowadays. I always tell people. People say, "Well, what's wrong with the Yankees?" I tell them one thing. I said, "You're missing a Mickey Rivers." And when we had Mickey Rivers on that team, that made the team go. He was an injured. Mick quick. Yeah. Mick he quick. was an injured. Mick was an injured. Mick always got on him and Willie Randolph when yeah. it's second. And it was always, when we got up, it was always the first and third, the first inning. We always were winning uh, one to two to nothing when they got up. you have some memories of my buddy Fritz Peterson? Oh, I see Fritz all the time. Fritz, yeah, I was a guest. I love Fritzy. Oh, you, have you spoken to Fritz? Many times. Oh, okay. So you know about times. all his books he's written. Yep. Okay, and you know all the books. The Horace Clark era and um Oh so you read his books. Have you read his new book? Yeah, he revised it recently and yeah. just he just came out with it and um we're talking on Facebook about it and he's mellowed on his opinion of uh Horace Roy White. Clark. He, oh Roy White right? he, you know you know uh, you know about Roy what he said about Roy. No, you know yeah, that. Roy White, not on Horace Clark. Yeah, not on Horace Clark. I don't think, Clark, he but Horace White. Clark was all that great. Yeah, <laughs> Just, and, he, and, and when Chris <laughs> told me I was going to take a dip, you know what that means, right? Yes. Yeah, he, he told me I was going to take a dip. I told him, I don't dip. <laughs> I go straight up. <laughs> and so yeah. in his uh, last book, he said, I don't, go, I don't go down. I go straight up. And I <laughs> said, he said, uh, he said uh, Joe Pepitone is going to take a dip. You know, like that. So, anyway, you know, I'm, I'm with Fritz all the time. We we just did a cruise with uh, – uh, last year we did a cruise. Uh, uh, it was Art Chamsky, uh, myself, Fritz, uh, Al Clark. Remember the umpire, Al Clark? I do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was Al Clark who we went on the uh, – and he was great. You know, he lives uh, – you, you know he changed his name. You knew that, didn't you? Al Clark? No, no, you knew that Fritz changed his name. No, I didn't. Oh, yeah, he changed his name. I'm, maybe I'm not supposed to say this, but if it gets on the air, he changed his name so, you know, people would know who he was. You know where he lives now, don't you? In Illinois. Huh? No, no. He, he, right now he's uh, uh, in, in Minnesota now. Oh, okay. Uh, in the Midwest, right? Yeah, he, he lives in the Midwest. And, you know, Fritz, uh, I just spoke to Fritz. Uh, do you Facebook ask Fritz about the manatee? Okay, <laughs> you know he'll tell do you, you about Facebook the manatee. Facebook run? Huh? Do you Facebook? I have no idea how to do that stuff. I don't want oh, to know all right. that stuff. Well, I don't do, I don't do that social Wayne's, media. Wayne's giving a class to Craig. Maybe he can include you. Who did? <laughs> I have no okay, idea. I'm just I don't want to do it. I don't want to. Yeah, right. Let me ask you, let me ask you this. With my bills. Let me, you were number 14, am I correct? Well, no, 12. 12. 12. 12. Lou Pinello right, was so, 14. Lou Pinello All right, I'm 14. going to give you the voice of the Yankees doing, doing, Rod, here we go. Okay. Now batting for the Yankees, number 12, Ron Blumberg, number 12. Very nice. Very, very nice. Now, uh, hey, Ron, Ron, how did you, how were you, were you, did you pick 12? Did they give you, did they No, they gave me number 12. 12. That was Gil McDougal's uh, number. Yes, it was. Gil McDougal. It yeah. was Gil McDougal's number. They gave me that. Thank God, because normally they give the rookies number like 88, 89, 96. You know, when <laughs> I had a number like that, I knew I was going to be sent down pretty quick. So when well, no, when 12, you, right, but you, when you're a number one draft choice, you get the cream of the crop. Well, you do. You should. You know, I mean, hey, you yeah. know, I mean, uh, you know, you work for it. But I know a lot of uh, number one draft choice did not make it. And, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, I was, unfortunately, I had an injury-prone career. Uh, you know, they could never, nobody could ever tell you I didn't give 120% whatever I did. If I have to run into a, a wall, uh, you know, I hit a home run in Milwaukee, hurt my shoulder. 
and, you know, had a shoulder operation. And, you know, and back then you don't have the uh, uh, modern technology with all the, uh, uh, you know, medicine that you do. You know, now, you know, back then you had to, you know, you, uh, um, you know, cut muscle to muscle. And when you cut muscle to muscle, it takes a lot longer to heal. And now, you know, nowadays they don't even cut you open. They just put a needle through you and tie you up. Lots of scarring. Lots of scarring. Yeah. The big, you know, the, the, the like big the innovation is the MRI. Yeah. Where well, they know I, what's ro- where they know what's wrong with you in advance. Yeah, we had no idea to. what that was. Only thing, you know, whenever we hurt a shoulder, hurt your knee, you know, you got a bruise on it. Put your put ice on it. Put heat on it. And that's what right. they did. You know, you know, you, 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 you're a number to them. You you got to go out and play. You have one year contracts. Nowadays, you got the four year contracts. You know, you, you you know, you hurt yourself, well, and you then you go on the three year disabled list, and you come back. With your Tommy career, Don. they think you come back. Your with career Tommy Don. basically went into free agency. Yeah, I was at that. Yeah, no, I, I went into free. I, I went to the White Sox, but. You know, to be honest with you, I knew I was injured and stuff, and, and Bill Vec took uh, me on at, with the White Sox, and, you know, I knew that I could not perform up to my abilities and stuff. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I made a, a, a drastic change uh, to go from Chicago to New York. I should not have done that, uh, but I did. Uh, so, but, you know, hey, I got released from the why I couldn't play. I, I wasn't insurable for Lloyd's of London anymore, and and uh, so I got released. And you know, and uh, uh, you know, I got asked to come back to play and to to come back and to rehab all that stuff. I, you know, I mean, it took me two years to get back to playing six months uh, rehab. You know, and, and whatever. It was very difficult to do. It was very hard to do. And. And you know, what back was then, the adjust- hey, what was the adjustment like for you after be you know not playing anymore the first few years? Well, you know, it was very hard. You go through a career divorce. It's very <sighs> difficult. You know, you you play uh, sports your whole life. You know, I mean, uh, it was very lucky that you know I was very blessed to be able to make it past you know just sports and uh, to have a, uh, a fairly decent career up in New York and, you know, and, and, and whatever. And, and, you know, when they tell you you could not play baseball any longer, it's very difficult. You know, you watch these guys, you know, these guys that, you know, making millions and millions of dollars, and, you know, after their career is over with, you know, they, you know, number one, I don't see how they, you know, spend 40, 50, 60, 80 million dollars, but they do. Uh, you know, and, uh, but, uh, it's, it's very hard, you know, but, you know, I was, you know, I was very lucky that, you know, uh, I did a lot of radio and TV up in New York and I know how to speak to people and, but a lot of these guys are very introverted. A lot of these guys are, you know, uh, uh, not good speakers across, you know, to, uh, across, the, you know, where they could go across the country and, speak about their career, speak about baseball, and speak about sports, and it's very hard. Now, all of a sudden, you've you played sports your whole life, and that's all you did. So you can't become a mechanical engineer, or you can't become a <coughs> a statistician. You know, I mean, it's a very hard, you know, to, it's, 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 it's very hard to get accustomed to it. But it's very easy right. to get accustomed to it now because, I mean, if you're smart enough, if you've got $60 million coming to you, even if you want to spend 90% of the money, you got $5 billion to put in the bank, right. and, you know, you could have a nice life, you know? Right. And you have many good played, memories of the $55 million too, which is... Oh, yeah. When I played in 73, when I hit 329, they gave me a $500 raise, and next year I hit 311, they took my $500 back. So, you know, I mean, it wasn't these things where it would play me or trade me, and I'm not going to play any longer. You know, if you're not going to play any longer, we'll get somebody else. That's how it was. I, I just That's, read, Ron, yeah. this will make you happy. The minimum salary today. The I know. Minimum, what, what, are you 000. talking about the rookies or are you talking about the players' players? I'm talking minimum major league salary is 500000 and that's Yeah, 500000 five, right. I think it's uh, well, 525000 when I came oh, up, it was, excuse it was me, $7,500. That... Right. <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, people, you know, hey, you've been out of, you know, 
you know, I've been out of baseball a long time. People always will say, uh, do you have uh, – uh, uh, where's your mansion? You know, people don't realize <laughs> you don't have a mansion. You know, people don't realize that, you know, most of the players when we played, they had two jobs. They had two jobs. Right. You know, you, you know, it's Al Downing. Al Downing had two jobs. You know, I think mm-hmm. Al, you know, picked for the Yankees, and I think he worked uh, – I don't know where he worked. I think, did he sell cars or did he work at Barney? Yeah, I remember guys like Frank Gifford and Kyle Rote living sure. in New York and working downtown during the during the off season. Sure, they probably got at the you garbage know, salesmen, district, and, you know, and selling sure, equipment. They, you know, people selling. don't realize that this is what they did. This yeah, is what they did. We had we made no money, and you You're know, right. but hey. Let me ask, you know, people always ask me, are you happy that you played the years that you did? I said, yes. Because the game of baseball is not really a fun, it's it's monetarily fun, because they know that, you know, you could go 0 for 50, and you still got a career, and that you still know you got guaranteed money. But, you know, but we had such a good time, because the Bronx Zoo, but when we played, we played with some crazy people on our team. But we had such a great time, and that's why the Yankees were the Yankees, and that's why when whenever you got to put on that Yankee pinstripes, that means more than uh, than any team in the game of uh, sports. When you put that Yankee pinstripes, people will talk about the Dodgers or the Giants or, you know, but nothing like the Yankee pinstripes, and the Yankee pinstripes are the uh, probably the only uniform that's never changed. In my, well, it's changed a little bit. But uh, you still got the Yankee pinstripes, am I right? Yep. Yes. And the cap yes. still has the NY with the. That's oh, what it is. So. And we, hey, if you go to Israel, let me tell you something. There's more people wearing uh, Yankee caps and uh, 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 Israeli caps. <laughs> so, so, so it's uh, uh, it's it's a great brand. The Yankees are a great brand. Right. Well, Israel did have Mickey Mental, didn't they? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Gen- I'm sorry, gentlemen. We we we're we're at an hour. Uh, we okay, got. I'm, I'm sorry, I bored you. I probably bored you. Oh no, not at all. I was, about to, I was about to say, let let me stop the show, but nobody has to hang up. Okay. So uh, with that, Ron, I'd like to thank you for for coming on. You enlightened us greatly. I mean, really, uh, it was. How would I describe it? Uh, what you gave us was serendipity, more than, than we could have expected, or more than what I expected. You really, you, I mean, you really, you really gave it all and, and gave us great insight into the Yankees, what it was like to play for them, to play with some of the players in your career and your outlook itself. So, and I hope, I hope you'll uh, come back sometime. And uh, let me just press a button and we'll stop and, and then we can get it all together. Hold on. Adios, everybody. Are you still there? Yeah. We're there.